Jesus is King. He controls everything. He is with me each night and each day. I trust my soul to the Savior's control. He drives all fear away. How can I fear? Jesus is dear. He watches, watches over me. Worries all see. song. Praise the Lord. Sure appreciate that. Thank you, ladies. What a wonderful thought. Let's stand, if you would, and turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Romans in chapter 8. Romans in chapter 8. What a wonderful, wonderful uh, portion of Scripture. My, I mean, my favorite portion of Scripture <clears throat> uh, is this Romans 6, 7, and 8, I think are the most three most important uh, chapters in the entire Bible. I really believe that. And uh, in Romans chapter 8, we pick up at verse 14. Romans chapter 8 in verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. We just heard that sung a moment ago. But ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Let's pray. Father, we come to these verses of Scripture and they talk about the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit indwelling us. And it is an entire new life uh, that you've given to us, that you've imparted unto us. And Lord, this life is your life. It's the God life. And it's inside of us and through us and in us. And, and Lord, I just pray that it would raise our awareness, raise our sensitivity Lord, uh, raise our understanding, increase our awareness, dear God, of the indwelling power of the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. We love you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. May may be seated. This uh, chapter in Romans chapter 8 is talking about the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. We spoke uh, in the beginning that uh, there is a new law. The new law is that there's no condemnation for sin. Now that we're in Christ, there's no condemnation for sin. Uh, There's no more control by sin. There's no more continuance in sin. That's Romans 8, verses 1 through 4. And then we study through verse 16, the new Lord. Because the new uh, concept that's being brought across here is that the Holy Spirit, God Himself, is living inside of us. Hitherto, as lost people, we were in the flesh, and in the flesh, the flesh therefore was dominant. The f- sin was dominant. It reigned in our bodies, it dominated. It was the master. Sin was our master. But now, with the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, No longer is sin our master, but the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the Spirit of Christ, is our new Lord that indwells us. Are you with me? So that is the great 
concept, if you would, of this chapter is the indwelling Holy Spirit. In this chapter, uh, it, it goes so deeply into so many things, but don't, don't, you know, let me keep the rock skipping on top of the water. Don't lose it in its depth and its implications, but it's about the indwelling power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Because in verses 6, in Romans 6 and 7, remember, uh, there we, we learned about uh, the, the, the things we should learn and things we should know and principles that we have when it comes to sanctification. And yet now it's an experiential thing. When it comes to the presence of the Holy Spirit, I, I, I'm, I feel like, I, but I wish I can get a guest preacher to come up. I wish I, you know, get a, get a, uh, let me get some expert on this thing, amen? Uh, but to, uh, to abide, someone who is abiding all the time and the filling and glory of all the things that we see in this, in this, in this chapter, it is, I, I'm so humbled, I'm going to crawl under a rock when I'm reading it. Are you listening? That this is the potential that we have. I mean, it's like standing there at a city block, Right? And, uh, you know, the father of the company is telling, if I'm, if I'm the son, and he's like, well, here you go, son, you have an, you have an open checkbook, you got all the money you need, uh, build whatever you want. I'm like, oh, wow, that's, man, what potential that we have. They could build a skyscraper. I mean, I could build the biggest building that we have. I've got city blocks here that I can, I can fill. I can do the foundation. I can, I can, it will be the, the tallest building in the world. I've got all the money. I've got everything I can do. And, and I feel like that when I come to chapter 8. Because it is, well, here you go. Here's the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. God Almighty that spoke the worlds into existence. He's residing inside your body. And that's a mystery, amen? There is a, Bible says, a mystery of the indwelling Holy Spirit. But that's the reality of what we're trying to get at. And this last part, that's the new Lord, but this last part here is the new life. And this is, uh, it's so compelling. Um, and there's two points under this, and it's really uh, verses 14 through the uh, end of the chapter. And it's... Uh, it's, it's, again, the new life. We had the new law, the new Lord, and this section is the new life. This is the way that God intended his children to live. I mentioned this morning, I mentioned Abraham. And God said, I will make of thee a great nation, singular. That was his original plan. And then, you know, wifey got impatient, Hagar got involved, and Ishmael was born, and you know, then there was nations involved, right? But God did not intend that originally. And God intended this to be our experience. This is our, this is our DNA as a Christian. The moment we got saved, what we're reading in these verses is what God intended to be our normal Christian experience. And that's a scary thought, by the way. Because the more that we dig into this, and the more that I'm away from this, shows you that I'm not living the normal Christian life. You know, old Vance Havner is an old evangelist. Um, he said, the average Christian lives so subnormal that what is normal is abnormal. Let me say it again to get it. The average Christian lives such a subnormal Christian life that what is the normal Christian life seems abnormal. I mean, to see a happy Christian skipping along, full of the Holy Spirit, and, and doing God's work and all that, that might say, wow, well, that's only those super Christian people. Are you listening? We are living so subnormal that what is normal seems abnormal. So we come here to, uh, uh, and now I divide this last portion, verses 14, uh, through the end of this chapter. And it is the, uh, uh, it's, it's divided into two main sections. One, number one is the blessings of sonship, being a son. And there's a, there's, a, there's a distinction here with the adoption as a son to being a child or children of God. But we'll get into that tonight. And then also the bounty of security. Now, remember, I said this morning, I'm going to start talking tonight about 
why I believe in eternal security. And this section is the treatise, amen, from God Almighty and why I believe in eternal security. And uh, so we look under here, we look at verse 14, and uh, we already dealt with this last night or last week as the power uh, of the resurrection, the power of death. We talked about the power of leadership and the power of adoption and intimacy. And what that is, the power of, the, of my life in Christ. And, and, but I want to come at it a, different, a little different angle tonight and just talk about the blessings of sonship. Now, underneath this, I divide it even again. Um, I, I divide it again. The blessings of sonship. We have the internal witness of the Spirit. Okay? We have the witness of the Spirit. That's internal. That's inside of me. And then we have the manifestation of the Spirit. That's external. We'll get into that in a minute. There's the witness of the Spirit, which is internal. That's my internal experience. And then there's the manifestation of the Spirit. That's external. That's what other people are going to see and what other people see even now. Um, so let's look here at the witness of the Spirit. And again, I, we've already um, uh, covered this. I just wanted to dig in a little bit. Uh, on this idea or this distinction uh, and what this idea of spirit of adoption means. So we look here at the witness of the spirit. Again, our new life is based on two main things. The blessings of being a son or a child of God and the bounty of being secure in Christ. Those are the two things. That, that, that is our life. Amen? That is our life. And it is so powerful. Now, Um, So in this blessings of being a son, we're looking here at the witness of the Spirit inside of us. Now, we mention here in verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, okay? So we have the sons of God. We have that term, the sons of God. And uh, look what it says in verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We mentioned the intimacy that that, that, that evokes uh, and that, that implies last week. But let me look at that word adoption just for a moment. See, that word adoption, is, is, uh, it, it's an interesting word. It it's actually comes from, now, we, use, we, we have the understanding of adoption, right? Somebody who's not your, necessarily your birth child, and, uh, but it's someone that you have chosen or had some experience outside of your normal procreation experience, and you, and you legally bring them into your family, they are legally your child, right? That's We understand that term, adoption. And uh, we say that through Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, we are legally a child of God, okay? That there is legal right, if you would, for us to claim being a child of God. But oh, is it so deep in that. See, this term adoption, the, the, the Greek word underneath it, has to do with adult sons when they come of age. Now listen carefully. This is, this is powerful. It's when in, in the household, when the, an adult son comes of age, that they are able to inherit the leadership of the entire estate. And it's at that moment, literally, that they become co-heirs with the father that they at that moment legally that they become that that son becomes representative of the father they can sign legal documents they can hire and fire servants right that that father is bequeathed that mantle of legal authority of the household if you would and that and that child has come of age that's what it means it means an adult son who has come of age, and not just our understanding of they're outside the birthright. Now, that also works, that, that what I'm saying, the adoption idea, because, you know, it says that we are, we are grafted in. You know, we covered that in Romans 6. The idea that God, you know, chose the Jews, and when they rejected Christ and their king, that God turned to the Gentiles. And we are, you know, we are like, uh, we're grafted into the tree of God's promise and blessing. So there is an aspect where that idea of adoption infers that. Do you follow me? That there's an application of that that is accurate. Now stay with me. 
But this idea of an adult son who comes of age and legally has not just you're out of the, you know, our, our understanding of adoption. You're out of the normal procreative process into that family. But you come in, I choose you from an orphanage or whatever. I'm going to adopt you. It's, it's more than that. It's you, even it could be my own biological son. It could be an adopted son. But when you come of age, that at that moment you have legal right to the entire estate. That, that spirit of adoption literally... It means when we are when we get saved, we are. It's like we are an adult son in the house of our father, and he has given us complete right to everything. Now watch. Now that is an internal experience, right? And um, so, because it says the spirit. Of adoption, and I'm going to I'm going to get into that. There's more technical issues in just a moment, but here we're talking about the spirit of adoption, and then we see in the very next verse. Look at what it says, and uh, verse 16: The spirit itself beareth witness that we that with our spirit that we are the children of God. So again, the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, "Abba, Father," but also uh, the spirit of what I'm I'm using the term the spirit of confirmation, and that is. Where we know internally that we are a child of God. So there's the, that's an inner experience. That we are adopted into the family. That God has given us the ability. And there is a confidence that comes through that. That we, are, we have rights. I know we're so against people demanding their rights, right? You know, Patrick, we get mad at these millennial kids that want their rights, you know. That it's like... Uh, um, the prodigal son came. I want my rights. You know, that's the Laodicean age. That's what that word Laodicean age. They want their own rights. I have a right to this. I have a right to that. But in this context, we ought to be folks that want our rights. We have a right to all the blessings of God. I almost want to go, you know, do a clip of a charismatic preacher, amen, to get the point across. They got some of this down better than we do. Someone say amen right there. They're not all wrong. Hallelujah. The spirit of adoption, the spirit of confirmation that we are that inside of us, we know that we're a child of God, that we are born from above, that it's an inner confirmation. It's an experience. It's something experienced. It's not just you go to class and you learn this stuff. Amen. It's an experience. It's an inner witness. It's an internal, the witness of the spirit inside of us. Now, let's, let's go, let's continue in verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God. So, okay, so, okay, what is verse 16? So the spirit itself bears witness with my spirit that we are children of God. See, again, it, so it switches. Notice it switches the spirit of adoption, and then it switches to the word children. Those are two different words. Even in the Greek, there's two different words. And, and, and it's intended. The, 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 one that's, the one that's children is, I know that I'm born again. I am born again into the family of God. The other one is what I just explained, the adoption. It's the adult son who has a legal right to the entire estate. Whereas the other, that I'm an inner witness of a child of God, I know I'm saved. I know I'm a child of God. Do you understand the difference? So it's an inner witness to both of those experiences. That I have legal rights to everything and that I'm a child of God. I'm born again. That is my father. That is my spiritual father, right? Hey, remember when Jesus came uh, and was born to Mary? He didn't have a human daddy, right? Or he had a human daddy, but he didn't have a human father. Okay, you with me? The seed came from the Holy Spirit. It didn't come from Joseph. So just like that, friends, when we get saved, we might have, a, we might have this physical body that we're still alive in, but we have, a, we have a divine father. Someone say amen right there. We have, a, and we have a right to that. We have a legal right to all the blessings that that implies. 
that that's daddy up there. Now watch. Now, underneath this idea of confirmation, it goes even deeper. Look at verse 17. And if children, okay, it, 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 it kind of cycles back and forth. Because, it, okay, I'm an adult son who has legal rights to everything, and but I'm also born again and I'm a child, okay? But then it says, if I'm a son, if, if, I'm a, th- if children, then I'm an heir. I'm an heir of God and joint heirs with Christ. I, I, I don't know how to even teach this. I, I, don't, I, have no, I don't even know how to illustrate this. I mean, do you understand what that just said? I mean, I'm not pausing for dramatic sake. Like, I don't have anything to say. But I'm, I'm staggering with the words to, to, to use to describe what this means. That as children of God, we have the right to everything that Jesus is getting? We're a joint heir with Christ? I'm like, I mean, what? Are you listening? I, it doesn't even make any sense to me. It, it does not make, I, I don't even understand it. But God is saying that every, that when Jesus will inherit, remember, he's going to, he's going to make the whole world his footstool, Right? Hebrews says that. Revelation is, 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 I'm just for time's sake, I'm not going into all those verses because there's so much to cover here. But when everything, when the thousands upon thousands upon ten thousands are singing and praising and worshiping the Lamb forever and ever, we're a part of that? We're getting some of that? I don't even understand it. It's like being found a vagabond on the side of the road by the wealthiest man in the world and being adopted and one day saying, here's the keys of the kingdom, son. They're like, I, you just, well, I don't deserve this. I, you just found me on the side of the road. But you're my child. And it's time for you to legally take I'm going to pass off the scene and here's and it's written down in the will that you're getting it all they didn't deserve it but understand how it's connected to grace if God was going to to cleanse us from our sin and give us eternal life and redeem us and take us to heaven we think we we think it's like this little cute little like story i can read a kid in a book right the wordless book okay my heart was dark with sin right it's precious blood i know it's washing white as snow and in god's word i'm told i walk the street of gold you see go to heaven right yay i mean we get to think the gospel is like that and it is that simple because kids can get saved amen it should be that simple it is that simple but, oh, but listen to me, but it shouldn't be that simple for you and me. And we've been around a while. We're reading, we're understanding the depth uh, that we are co-heirs with Christ. That as much as I got saved and I have heaven as my home, but it's more than that. God's given me, God's putting my name on the deed in heaven. Huh? Because he's going to inherit it all. The father's going to give it all to the son. The whole world is going to be his, you know, something to put his feet up, his footstool. I, I, do you understand this? Maybe you can help me because I don't. Good heavens. Why would God allow me to bring me to that height? I don't even understand. Now watch. See this next verse. It says, it, it is an interesting thing. Why? Paul would bring up this next point. Now, it says this in verse 17. If children, if I'm a child of God, then I'm an heir. It's, it's automatically connected with my new birth and my new life, that my new life will end with inheritance. 
Okay? It's automatically connected. You're on that train. Uh, it's like that uh, parable that Jesus said, right? When the person came and worked uh, in the early part of the day, they agreed to work for X amount of money. And then the other person came in 10 minutes before closing time for the same amount of money. And that guy got mad. He's like, wait a minute. I, but, you know, we, we contracted that that's what you were going to do. Whether we got saved when we were young and we got saved five minutes before that, it doesn't matter. When you get on that train, that train all ends the same spot. Amen? Now, there's going to be different rewards in heaven, right? That's all, that's all different. Okay? Now, watch. Look what he says in verse 17 in the second part. He says, we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him that we may be also glorified together. Let me just finish this. So now some commentators believe that that if so be is almost a conditional clause. Like if you suffer for God, then you'll get a special glorification. Now some have taught that. But I don't believe that. Because... I, I, you know, I don't want to correct the King James Bible, okay? But it, it doesn't seem thematically and theologically consistent that there are some that are going to achieve. Now, there are some that, as we know, that are going to achieve gifts. Some will be saved, yet so as by fire, right? Some are going to, you know, all their works that they've done to so the time they got saved, the time they breathed their last breath, it's going to be wood, hay, and stubble burned up at the feet of Jesus at the beam of seat judgment. In some, it'll be gold and, and uh, precious stones. It'll be something of value that, you know, will we'll put a crown on his feet and he'll be able to, uh, to, to do that. Now, so I understand there's differences of, of rewards, okay, for Christians to earn as to how they live. And it's contingent upon how much and how they have suffered. That, uh, that notice this idea of suffering for Christ, that we may be also glorified together. Now, again, I don't have time to get into that. I, I do have a reference point here. But uh, the, one of the uh, um, uh, prerequisites to how we're going to be placed in authority in the millennial reign of Christ is how much we've suffered So this idea of suffering and glory, when it comes to whether it's the placement of our authority and position, if you would, in the administration of Jesus Christ for a thousand years when he reigns and rules physically from Jerusalem. You know, if, am I going to be like, you know, uh, sweeping up, uh, you know, the dirt somewhere in uh, South Africa? I don't know where I'm going to be like trucking around the new Jer Jerusalem. I don't know. Right. So there's a lot of that differences depending on how much I suffer and do for God in the midst of suffering. But it's all, and it's also, uh, there's qualifications or designations of awards. But ultimately, that term glorified together, that term glorified together is we're all going to be glorified together. We are all going to receive our glorified body. So I want to make that distinction. We're all going to receive, and I have a whole point about, uh, about uh, my next point, is the witness of the Spirit. I'll just introduce it here, and we'll deal with it next week, when we deal with the manifestation of the Spirit, that external experience. All this is internal. The Spirit of confirmation, the child of God, and I feel that this, and I have rights, and all that. That's something, in per that's something inside of my heart that I experience. But... But this idea of glorification and glory is the manifestation of the Spirit in and through me outward. And that's the future glorification of the saints. And it starts at that in verse 17. Because it says glorified. Verse 18, it says glory revealed. Verse 19, it says manifestation of the sons of God. Verse 21, it says the glorious liberty of the children of God. It talks about the redemption of the body in verse 23. It's all this future time when it'll be, when who we are and what we are will be manifest. Now stay with me. So all of this, again, is the witness of the Spirit. It's internal. And then, now let me jump down to verse 23. This is a little bit out of order, but I want to include it. 
with this idea of what's underneath the spirit of confirmation, our inheritance with Christ, our suffering for Christ. And then look at the fruit for Christ over here in verse 23. And not only that, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. So this groaning is an experience inside of us, that we are groaning for that, that we are, we are sick and tired. And you know how when you get older, you're just, uh, Man, I, I got to like verbalize sometimes just to stand up. Amen. I got to get, okay, let's go. And um, that's that groaning. It's, it's that in our spirit inside of us. And uh, it's groaning to be able to shuckle off uh, this, this, uh, this outward uh, uh, physical body, this earth suit, if you would, that's all corrupted and sinned. But to push all that off and live our new man and get our glorified body and experience Christ forever. The first fruits of the spirit is something inside of us. This is the blessings of sonship. And it's the first thing that we need to consider when we're, when we're talking about our new life with Christ in the Holy Spirit, but the fact that we are saved forever and what that means. You see, being a child of God, being a child of God, being a legal son, God's not going back on that deal. And I know there's, there's, uh, there's folks that will say, well, wait a minute, because, well, what if you make a decision and you turn your back on God? Well, I don't know. There's the question. They went out from us, but they were not of us. So you could have had an emotional decision for a while, and then your life proved that you were not truly born again. But to be a child of God, you are born into his family. God is not taking away his life that he, put in, that he spiritually put inside of you. Amen? This is just the first step. As a son of God, that we are saved forever. Let's pray. Let's all stand and have... um